welcome to the Chaos and Light podcast. I am your host, Angela Levesque, and on today's episode, I am speaking again with Stephen Holly Martin, and we are talking about something that I've always been quite interested in, the Salem Witch Trials, which my guest today actually has a great, 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 I think six times great relative who was involved in those witch trials. So he gets to share from his personal, like familial experience, as well as the research that he did putting his book together. If you haven't checked out chaosandlight.com yet, or haven't been there in a while, there's all sorts of podcasts, even beyond the Chaos and Light podcast, articles on intention, synchronicity, consciousness, Um, all sorts of resources for your conscious evolution, as well as if you are in need of guidance, if you find yourself in a life transition, do check out the offerings page there, as well as the Sacred Geometry page if you haven't been there yet. So uh, yeah, check out chaosandlight.com. I will be back after this ridiculously short break with Stephen Holly Martin. Are you enjoying this podcast and want to help this lady out? Well, share it with friends, or even better, leave a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear from you. Now back to the show. I am back again today with Stephen Holly Martin. Uh, As a talk show host of a popular weekly internet podcast, The Truth About Life, it became clear as he interviewed dozens of near-death survivors, psychics, paranormal researchers, quantum physicists, and medical doctors, that humankind is on the cusp of a transition to a new understanding of our true of the true nature of reality. To share what he has learned and to help us speed transition, which he believes will result in the rebirth of optimism and the world becoming a better place to live and work, he has written well over dozens of books, many of which have achieved bestseller status on Amazon. Um, I want to welcome uh, Stephen Holly Martin back uh, to the Chaos and Light podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to our chat. Yes. Well, uh, we uh, when you sent me an email about this topic, I was I've always been kind of interested in the Salem witch trials. I have done a uh, past life regression with a hypnotherapist, and they took me back to a lifetime where I lived uh, during that time. I wasn't actually burnt at the stake, but I was. Um, part of that. And uh, so let's start. What what kind of piqued your interest in writing this book on on the witch trials? Well, I grew up uh, knowing, I I can't remember when I first heard it, but I know it was I was a little child that uh, I was descended from one of the women who was uh, hanged as a witch back in Salem in 1692. Her name was Susanna North Martin. And my mother was really very uh, you know, upset about all that, you know, she, uh, (laughs) I guess my mother was kind of an early feminist and uh, just thought it was horrible that what happened uh, back in the, uh, back in those days. And she was kind of a anti-Christian fundamentalist as a result of it, I suppose. Anyway, I grew up hearing about it all my life. And I, and I think it kind of effect, kind of had an effect on who I became and, you know, and so, yeah, it's been something I've known all my life, and I decided not too long ago to see what I could find out for myself about it, rather than what I'd heard about it all my life. So that, that's what this book is about. Well, so I'm sure most of my listeners have heard about the Salem Witch Trials, but if you could help us understand maybe some of the historical context that this uh, this movement kind of grew out of, and maybe give us an idea of, you know, what was the scale? How many people, how many uh, women were uh, killed because they were, you know, convicted of witchcraft? Yeah, well, it um, came about because the Massachusetts Bay Colony was a theocracy. Back in, I guess it was around 1630, uh, the Puritans under uh, John Winthrop uh, got a charter from King James, uh, King Charles, excuse me, the first, to set up a theocracy in, uh, in Massachusetts. I think there were some already some people there, the Mayflower course had landed there 10 years before that, but a kind of a whole armada of ships sailed from England in 1630. And I believe that my ancestor was on one of those ships. She would have been a child at the time. And they landed in 
in Massachusetts, and it was a theocracy. The Bible was the law there. The Puritans uh, were very religious people, as you probably already know, and uh, and so they just decided that they would uh, would have this theocracy. They wanted to get away from the Church of England, which is, of course, what uh, most of people in England at that time, and still, I suppose, are. Anyhow, um, they the environment there was such that um, at that time, this was in 1692 uh, when this took place, and my great, great, many times great grandmother would have been in her early 70s by then. Uh, was this was a difficult time? Uh, they had problems with Indians, and suffice to say, they were kind of paranoid. And of course, they the, the Puritan religion was such that they they felt that life was a test, and they were constantly being tested, uh, sort of like Job, if you're familiar with that book in the Bible where Job, uh, you know, the patience of Job. Job is uh, God gives Satan permission to test Job. That's in the Old Testament. That's who Satan is. He's he's the tester. He's the one that tests people more so than have the modern idea of being, you know, a devil with horns. And uh, they felt they were being tested all the time and that there were people who uh, were, had gone over to the dark side. You know, Puritans, even if you did everything right in your life and followed all the rules, you still might not get to heaven. At least that's what Puritans thought because only a few were chosen. You know, many are called, few are chosen. And even if you played by all the rules, you could still go to hell because you weren't one of the chosen. And so if you came to the conclusion that you weren't one of the chosen, you might as well uh, get in league with Satan because he would help you have a great life. And at least this life would be uh, a lot of fun and good before you uh, ended up in hell for the rest of eternity. So there were people, actually were people who were practicing witchcraft back then. Uh, as far as how many there were uh, 19 of uh, people that were executed. One was a man. The other, others were all women. Uh, it was typically women who were accused, but every once in a while, a man was. There was another man who died, but he wasn't, because of the uh, witch hysteria, but it was because they were trying to force him to make a plea of either guilty or not guilty, and they piled stones on his chest and and until it actually crushed his chest his final words were more weight and <laughs> the stones cru crushed his chest uh, but there were about 150 people accused uh, over the course of the whole thing and uh, about 50 of them confessed because if you confessed and uh, repented and asked God for forgiveness they let you go so the ones who were executed refused to do that. And the reason they refused, of course, is that, uh, you know, it was one of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not bear false witness. So they wouldn't lie. They felt like they could, they could confess when they, <laughs> that, that they were witches, even though it wasn't true and they'd get off, but they'd burn in hell because, of, because they told a lie. So uh, that kind of gives you an overview of the whole thing. What do you think? Okay, so of these 150 that were accused, was there, uh, did they practice a certain way of life? Were they, you know, pagan or, you know, would they be considered modern day Wiccan? Or were they just women who, uh, like, what was, the, what was the foundation or the basis for the accusations? Well, what happened, uh, you have to, we have to go back to how the whole thing started. As I said, people were kind of paranoid anyway, because the Indians were attacking every now and then. They thought, of course, Indians were devil worshipers because they were pagans. And uh, there were hard times and so forth. And like I said, uh, you know, people, the, the state of science back in the 17th century was like zero. They didn't even know that germs caused disease back then. So they thought perhaps somebody had cursed their cow when the cow, you know, died or stopped giving milk or whatever. And what happened is uh, there was a 
minister, a preacher named Paris, Reverend Paris, who had a couple of small children, girls. I think one was eight and the other one like 12 or something like that. And they had friends. And the, uh, the preacher would spend a lot of time away from home going around and tending to his flock, you know, people who were sick or people needed to, who were getting buried or whatever. And he and his wife were absent from home a lot. And during that time they were gone, uh, a slave whose name is Tituba and her husband took care of the children. But Tituba was a slave from, had, that had come with Reverend Paris from Barbados. That's where he had been before. So she was a native of Barbados and had grown up uh, with voodoo and that sort of stuff, magic. She wasn't a Christian. And so the way she entertained these children was with her magic tricks, with her fortune telling and that sort of thing. And of course, that was strictly forbidden. The children knew that. They knew they weren't supposed to be uh, participating in things like that. It was definitely a no-no with the uh, Puritans. But they did anyway, because I suppose, because it was entertaining. And uh, she, as I said, did fortune telling. And the kids started uh, having these symptoms of what, what we would call uh, schizophrenia or something like that, where they felt they were being attacked and there were voices and there were people tormenting them. Could have been because they were guilty. It could have been because old Tichuba opened up a door between the here and, uh, you know, beyond the veil and there were some paranormal stuff going on. Anybody who's, uh, if, if you, if you uh, Google, uh, Ouija board or Ouija warning, you'll find hundreds or thousands of hits where people have stories of that, of that uh, about what happens when they're playing with a Ouija board, you know, that, that sort of paranormal things start to happen. Anyway, whatever it was, these girls were, uh, and it wasn't just the two girls who lived there, other girls in the neighborhood came over. And so there were about six of them who started having these symptoms. And of course, the preacher wanted to find out what the heck was going on with them. And they said, he asked, he figured it was probably a witch or something that was attacking them because that's what they thought back then. And uh, they ended up accusing, first one they accused was a woman named Sarah Good, who was kind of the town beggar. I mean, she was an easy mark because she was probably looked like a witch and acted like a witch. And, and uh, so that's how it began. And then it kind of just spread, uh, like I said, hysteria across the whole region. In fact, my grandmother, seven times great grandmother, was actually from a town 20 miles away, Amesbury. And that, by the way, is the title of the book, The Witch of Amesbury. So that's how it got started. In that case with um, those children, did it ever come back to the woman that was the caretaker, the, the slave? Oh, yeah. She eventually got accused, too, you know. So, they, like I said, there were 150 accused, so it's hard not to get accused, almost. Uh, but she, yeah, Tituba was accused of being a witch, and she confessed. She said, yeah, I am. Mm -hmm. So she was not executed as a result. She did spend time in, in jail. Uh, when, once you were accused, the first thing they did was put you in jail. And then, of course, they had to have a trial and all that. And it wasn't always immediate. But she never went to trial because she confessed. Uh, she eventually was let go when they finally figured out that the whole thing was a great big mistake. Uh, but she uh, was on the witness stand at least took depositions from her that lasted like a couple of days. And she had fantastic stories to tell where she would, you know, go off on her broomstick and she participated supposedly, she said, in, in witches' covens where they all got together. And she said she had signed the devil's book, you know, with blood. And she, <clears throat> you know, when, when she testify, boy, that really stirred things up because if what she was saying was true, then there were a lot of people around there who were participating in, in, and were witches. Um, there were three degrees of magic back then. And magic, of course, is what <clears throat> was against 
the law against and in the bible i think it's in deuteronomy deuteronomy where after the uh, ten commandments are given there are a bunch of small laws something like 600 and some little laws that are given that that you know faithful jews today the orthodox jews keep still keep those laws and one of them is thou shalt not thou shalt shalt not allow a sorceress to live the three degrees of magic were white magic which was things like uh, horseshoes and rabbit's tails and so forth that were to bring good luck and that wasn't you know that didn't get you into too much trouble then the second degree was black magic which was putting a curse on somebody's cow or using an average effigy doll to stick pins in to torture somebody which is what a lot of people thought was going on and then the third degree the worst thing was to form a pact with the devil and <clears throat> there were people before that uh, time in 1692, before the witch hysteria of that, several years before, had been tried and convicted. And in the record shows that they, one of them at least, I believe her name was Good Wife, uh, Good Wife Glover, G-L-O-V-E-R, had actually formed a pact with the devil. And she spoke with him all the time and that sort of thing. She was probably a schizo, but uh, she, when she was tried, they brought effigy dolls that they found in her house into the courtroom, and she took the effigy dolls and started stroking them, and one of the witnesses fell on the floor writhing in pain because mm -hmm. of this effigy doll being, uh, being tormented. So, yeah, that uh, opened up the door, Tituba's testimony, to the idea there had to be dozens of witches around because she talked about getting together with them in these witches' covens. So there you go. So it's interesting. It sounds like not, and in, in no way am I saying that even if what those women were doing, if, if it was true that they should be uh, tried or, or executed, I'm not saying that, but it does sound like there was a certain amount of people that were engaged in witchcraft. It wasn't just, um, you know, somebody who likes to make tinctures and uh, use herbs and really, you know, uh, earth medicine and that sort of thing. There was legitimate uh, concerns, at least by the, the Puritans, that this was taking place. Uh, I, it was taking place. Now, uh, of the of those executed, I've studied this. It's amazing how much information is available. All the depositions that were taken, all the trial testimony. There were a lot of eyewitness accounts that uh, are still exist that you can read. And uh, my analysis of it is probably one, at least one of the 19 was a practicing witch. Uh, there may have been others, but uh, her name was uh, Bridget Bishop, and the reason I think that is because she, they did find effigy dolls in her house and stuffed in the walls of the basement. And uh, you know, you don't have effigy dolls if you aren't using them. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah, it it probably was true some of it, uh, but I think the vast majority of those who were accused and the one, unfortunately, the ones who were hanged. Uh, we're not uh, we're not practicing which is at least not uh, black magic or pack uh, pack with the devil kind of situation. My ancestor uh, had the reputation of being a witch for a long time and had been tried once before uh, much much 20 years before that and and was uh, found innocent. but she was kind of an er really, uh, must have been a strong woman and must have intimidated people very easily. I don't think she suffered fools very well. And she was, as I said, in her early 70s, which back then was really, really old. <laughs> and uh, she was, but, and her kids were all grown. I think her youngest was 30 years old. And she had something like eight children, seven of them lived to adulthood. And she was able, her, she was a widow and she was able to run the farm herself, which the idea that a woman could do that, especially in the 17th century, 
running a farm is not easy, chopping that wood and plowing the field and everything else. But she did all that herself. And so they figured she must use witchcraft if she was able to do that. She had to use magic because nobody, no 70 some year old woman could do that. Especially a woman, right? Especially, (laughs) especially a woman. Exactly. Yes, you talk in the in, in your book uh, specifically some of the the um, kind of mindsets that led to this sort of the the trials, and part of that is just the the standing of women at that time. Yeah, uh, women you, were second class citizens. You know, they didn't even get the right to vote until 1920 in the United States, as you know. So, I mean, they were kind of like almost like property in a way. They were supposed to be helpmates to their husbands. They weren't supposed to be somebody who could you know, manage on their own and run the farm. One of the great things in the trial that came out about uh, Susanna Martin, my ancestor, was that she <clears throat> had come gone uh, to see a friend from Amesbury to some other town nearby where she was something like eight miles. And it was in the spring and the snow was melting and it was wet and muddy. And when she got to the person's house, uh, her skirts, which of course they wore long skirts, and her shoes were not muddy. And uh, so they, they figured the person who uh, welcomed her in figured she must have flown there because how else could she get there without a muddy skirt and without muddy shoes? I figure she probably just held her skirt up and maybe had her shoes in her hand and washed them off before she got there. But anyway, that was in the trial. Testimony is one of the is evidence that she was must be a witch. It seems uh, kind of on one hand, they seemed very fastidious. They kept a, they, you know, had trials and they kept the testimony and all of that stuff remained intact. And yet they were so irrational and illogical, just (laughs) case in point, what you were saying about she couldn't have possibly made it there without getting mud on her skirt. So therefore she must be a witch. It seems so kind of on one hand, they're priding themselves on look at us. We're rational men, rule of law. Were amazing and yet what they were the allegations and very often the evidence was just wildly illogical and irrational well yeah and there are a couple of reasons for that what you know one of the things i talk about in the book and again the book is called the witch of amesbury uh, is that the state of science at that time was really like i said they didn't even know germs caused disease they thought that you know a disease was caused either by god for as part of a test or that it was a witch's curse or something like that well one of the things that that uh, was illogical and in fact is what ended up being the reason that the trials finally stopped and they called an end to it was that the judges allowed what's called spectral evidence Spectral being uh, like a specter is a ghost. So victims of these witches said that they were being attacked by a person's specter. Their ghost, their image, their spirit was coming after them and torturing them. And when Susanna came into the courtroom the first time for deposition, uh, the, the witnesses that were there, the ones who were the accusers, some of them fell on the floor writhing in pain because they said her specter had come and attacked them. And one of the things that Susanna said, she was a pretty smart cookie. She said, uh, it's not me, it must be the devil or Satan uh, impersonating me. And the, she quoted scripture that demonstrated that the uh, that the devil or Satan could take any form he wanted to and imitate or pretend to be anyone he wanted to. And that's what she said must be going on with these crazy people who were lying on the were rolling all around on the floor. So that spectral evidence, eventually, there was a lot of controversy about that. One of the Baptist preachers said, you can't use that, you know, and, but uh, the Puritan preachers uh, some of them for it, some of them were against it. Eventually, that's what derailed the whole thing. They realized that that was not kosher to use <laughs> spectral evidence. And most of the evidence was that was presented in the court was spectral evidence. So 
that's what finally ended up. Of course, the uh, the legend in my family was that Susanna's ghost came to the after she had been executed. Later on, came to the governor's uh, governor Phelps, who was the head honcho in that area, and said that if th he didn't stop this madness, that his wife was going to be next. And indeed, she was accused, and that's when they stopped the whole thing. So there you go. Was this? Did this go on anywhere else? Like, I, I remember prior to reading your book, when they talked about the witch trials, they talked about women being burnt at the stake. You were sp spoke about uh, the women being hanged. So, where? How did people get that confused? Was there other um, trials happening? In yeah, yeah, America? that's a good good question. Good question. In, in Europe, in France, in England, in Spain, and other places, uh, Catholic countries, the uh, witches, people accused and convicted of witchcraft were burned at the stake, like Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc, yeah. Uh, in England, they were not, they were hanged. And of course, uh, the tradition in, in America was English. As far as the other colonies, uh, in Virginia, for example, a law was passed before, long before this, that if you accused someone of witchcraft and didn't have proof or could not produce proof, you were fined 1,500 pounds of tobacco, which was probably a, a full crop, a year's crop for a small farmer. So people didn't go around accusing other people of being witches in Virginia very often. I think it may have happened, but I don't think anybody here was ever executed in Virginia. But uh, that was not the case in New England. So there were other witch trials in Connecticut and uh, other parts of New England that took place before the uh, Salem witch hysteria went on. That was the end of it, though. The Salem trials were the last ones, but there were others. And I, I mentioned a couple of, couple of them in my book. They were interesting. They, they, the people who were convicted and hanged there probably were practicing witches. Now that, like I said, that doesn't mean they ought to get hanged or what you, you agreed with me on that. I mean that, you know, there are people practice witchcraft today and they, they, they can do it as all they want. But, uh, that's what the law was because that's what the Bible said. So there you go. And speaking of, you know, modern day uh, witchcraft or Wic Wicca, would you say that that, do you know, would you say that that looks similar to what it looked like with these women were being accused of back then? Well, from my understanding of modern witches and Wic Wicca is that it's not a, uh, pack with the devil or even any kind of devil worship that there are satanists that but that's a whole different thing uh, modern witches are just really pagans they they believe that uh, the spirit of transcends everything that it's you know kind of imminent in all things but all things are manifestations of the spirit i suppose and they do uh have spells and things but they're they're goal is positive outcomes rather than trying to put a curse on somebody that's my understanding of it is anyway and it's really more like a religion which is uh, and karma is part of it they believe that whatever you send out you're going to get back so if you send out bad stuff you're going to get bad stuff back so you want to send out good stuff so good stuff comes back to you yes i would say not too many modern Wiccans have the doll or, or practicing any stuff like that. Um, so you start off your book, and I thought this was a really cool analogy. You talk about the Pyramid of Cans, and you said that uh, this book, warning, this book is might kind of shake your belief system. And so I would love for you to share that analogy of cans, because I thought that that was really clever. You know, I think that everybody has a system of belief, some things that have been built up since you were a child that uh, you and about how the world works and how what's true and what isn't. And it's all like a great pyramid of cans where they, they stack up until, you know, they reach the top. And but if you have a belief that's down at the bottom somewhere, one of the cans is holding everything up and it's 
erroneous and it's not true, if you pull that can out, the whole thing comes tumbling down because your belief system has been disrupted. So uh, one of the things that I, conclusions I come to in this book is that yes, there were people who were, were lying about uh, being attacked by witches, but there were others who something really was going on. And I think that there, certainly in some of the earlier trials and so forth that I mentioned, there were there was some paranormal stuff happening. And one of the things that I've learned uh, in my in the last 50 years of studying all this stuff that yes, there that the, a lot of that paranormal stuff is real. There is life after death. There are people who uh, don't go to the light, who stick around uh, on on the astral level of Earth and haunt houses and things like that. So uh, there is par- a lot of the paranormal is real that you, stuff you hear about. So if you think if you're a scientific materialist and believe that only matter exists, uh, when you finish reading this book. <laughs> Uh, and you see some of the evidence, it's, you're going to have to replace that can. And the problem is the whole thing, as I say in the book, could come tumbling down because then you got to build it back up based on what you now know. Because I, I found it interesting, too, that you went into, um, you talk about the Hobbes Newtonian, which you call kind of the old world view, which I think uh, that and religion kind of let it lends itself to myopic thinking. And uh, in order to broaden your idea of what is possible, what the true nature of reality is, to, to look at consciousness, you really need to, to open up your understanding instead of getting more reductionist as you go along. Um, I thought it was interesting that you talked about the double slit experiment and you go into some things around quantum mechanics. Why did you think that was important to introduce in a book about the witch trials? Well, it's to show that, in fact, there really is only one mind, and we are all part of that mind. <clears throat> I think the last time you and I talked, we got into the idea that consciousness is the ground of being. Now, you mentioned Hobbes. Th- Thomas Hobbes was an English philosopher who, among other things, said that only matter exists which is what is taught in school today, even though it's ludicrous to think so, because there are a lot of things that aren't matter that exist. I mean, we're talking uh, through this, this computer and somewhere or other there are waves of things and, you know, that are floating around the internet that make that possible. And that's not matter, that's energy. So everything is, not matter as people thought of it when Thomas Hobbes said that or what they thought about it before Einstein you know, came up with the theories of relativity and E equals MC squared and all that. Everything is either energy, which is vibrations, or it's matter, which is or vibrations. Everything is vibrations. And so the whole idea of scientific materialism, solid stuff, doesn't even exist. Now, the double slit experiment demonstrates that because what that is, and I'll try to explain it very briefly because it can be complicated to explain uh, without l- looking at a chart. Up until Einstein of uh, photo electric- electricity, you know, where, photo- where light hits metal and uh, photons and electrons bounce off the metal. Before that, experiment was published uh, back in the early 20th century, people thought that life, light was a wave. And in fact, white light does behave both as a wave and as particles. And the double slit experiment demonstrates that because what you have are two slits. This is the first time this experiment was conducted was in 1803, I believe by a guy named Young. And when you shine light through two slits that are not as wide as the wavelengths of light, it, what happens is you get a zebra pattern on the screen where w- waves overlap, where crests come together is white and where uh, 
the troughs come together, it's dark, it's a zebra pattern. But if you close one of the slits, what you get is light going through that one slit causes kind of a round light on the screen. Okay, so what happens in the double slit experiment is rather than shine a light through, you shoot light through one photon at a time. And if the scientist conducting the experiment, this experiment does not know which slit the photons are going through, each photon is going through, you get the zebra pattern, even though it's photons that are shot one at a time. If the scientist has a detector that tells him which uh, slit a photon went through, then you get the pattern of all the little dots on the screen, the photons hitting. And so it's his mind, what he thinks, what he knows that determines the out outcome of the experiment. If he doesn't know, he gets the zebra pattern. The, if he does know, he, he gets the, the spots on the screen. So to me, that demonstrates, and I think they'll, uh, there's a, been a book written about this called The Mindful Universe by quantum physicists, that you, our minds are all really connected. And uh, what you know or don't know determines the outcome, not only in this, but in other kinds of quantum physics experiments. But it was easy to put this one in the book because I could put a little chart that showed you what happened if you knew or didn't do. So the observer uh, is, plays a very important role. And so I wonder now, because you were talking about like, it's sort of like we, we look at Newtonian physics and in your book, you said it did such a wonderful job bringing us to where we are today. Um, and yet, I feel that if we hold on to that as that's the only truth, I think that we are maybe in danger of, of perpetuating, maybe not the same level of hysteria that happened during the, the Salem witch trials, but I see that perhaps it could lead to something. And, and I kind of, if, if in my humble opinion, we're, we're seeing some of that hysteria uh, in, in our you know, modern day, I think that we have taken that Newtonian or Hobbesian Newtonian um, sense of the world and we've uh, disallowed so much of the human experience that is connected to consciousness and energy and all of that. And I think that right now, science in some ways has become sort of a religion. And, and, and I think it's led to maybe some of the hysteria that we are, that we're seeing right now play out in, in front of us. Do you, would you agree with that? I, just, uh, uh, I agree that, that it has become a religion because scientific materialists continue to hold on to this idea that nothing exists except material substance. When things like the, the double slit experiment and there are others uh, too, you know, one of the people that I interviewed for my podcast was a lady named uh, Judy Bushell, Julie Bushell, and she's a PhD in pharmacology. And of course, in pharmacology, uh, mainly what you do is study whether drugs work or don't work. And you do that by having a control and double blind experiments that, uh, that make it possible to figure out whether, you know, you have a placebo and you have the drug and you see what works through this controlled double blind experiment. Well, her mother committed suicide and she wanted to find out whether her mother's uh, consciousness still existed. And so she started constructing experiments with psychics that were double blind, where there was no way that the psychic could know uh, what was going on with someone who was had passed away or things that they knew uh, because of the double blind way she set these things up. And she has now done, has started a whole, well, I think her organization is called the Winbridge uh, Institute or something like that. It's winbridge.org. That show that some psychics indeed can give information that there's no other way they could have known because you know what what you what you conclusion you come to is that, that the consciousness of that individual does exist even though they're gone 
and gone, uh, have died physically. So, I mean, there are other things that, uh, I don't know how much I put it of that I put in this particular book, but in other books, I've written a lot about it. And there's overwhelming evidence. What about reincarnation? The, the University of Virginia has been studying that for the last 60 years. And they have over 2000 cases that they've documented where uh, the child was able to remember the name and the place and the family and the brothers and the sisters and what job they had and all that sort of thing. And they go back and they find that person right where the child says they had been. So, I mean, how could that would have to, that, that means that memories are not stored in the brain. They're stored somewhere else in a non-physical realm. So obviously scientific materialism the basic premise that all that exists is material substance is incorrect. It's been proven, demonstrated over and over and over again, yet they hold on to this. I don't know what the problem is, except that, as you said, it's become a religion for some people. Yeah. There you go. I would say some of the, the parallels would be um, between maybe the, the role of science now and looking at some of the puritanical uh, belief systems and mindsets there is one creating the other. I think that even in science today, I think we're doing it politically as well. Like there's a lot of us versus them. There's a lot of um, having the other person, a lot of scapegoating, <laughs> those types of things. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, doubling down on certainty that I saw throughout your book that I also, I think is relevant right now that um, in, you know, because of the nature, the fluid nature of consciousness and the fluid nature of our world and our lives and all of that, I think that um, any time that we wanna get really kind of dogmatically certain about things and then use that <laughs> certainty to, again, maybe against the other or to scapegoat or whatever, I, I see a lot of that uh, even happening today as, you know, it's not near what the witch trials were, but I, I still, um, I still think there's the, that pretend propensity in human propensity in human nature for, for those types of things. Your opinions and what you believe often create your reality. I mean, think of it this way. A minute ago, I talked about uh, testing different drugs. Well, you always have a placebo. There are many cases and I uh, believe I even put one in this book we were talking about, where the placebo, which is a sugar pill, outperforms the drug that it's up against. In one case, I think it was uh, antidepressants. I think it was uh, placebo had 32% uh, success rate, whereas the Zoloft, the drug that you can, that's you know for sale now, you gotta have a prescription to get it, uh, only cured uh, 24%. So, you know, that's what, uh, what a big percentage difference. And, this, and it was the placebo. It was a sugar pill. So it was the person's mind that cured them, not the, uh, not the drug. And, and that still goes on. You know, I see ads on TV all the time for these drugs. It, some of, and, you know, there's this one now that's, you know, supposed to be, Oh, I don't, I, I don't can't remember the name of it, but you know darn well it's a placebo, and a lot of people who take it are going to get better. But it's because they think they're going to get better; they believe they get, that, that it's real medicine they're taking. So, I mean, our beliefs create our reality to a large extent. Well, we are almost up out of time here. Is there anything? Um, you are, I've mentioned this before, a prolific writer. You have many, many books that are available on Amazon. Uh, tell my listeners how they can find you and all of your, your many uh, works of writing. Yeah. Uh, well, the easiest way is to go come to my website, which is shmartin, S-H-M-A-R-T-I-N, shmartin.com. And uh, when you reach that website, you look up the top on the menu, there's a little tab that says books, click on that. It'll go to a page that shows most of my books, the covers of them. And you can click on any one of those covers and it'll take you to the page on Amazon where you can read the first chapter or whatever, and find out more about it. 
and even buy it if you want. So yeah, S-H-M-A-R-T-I-N dot com, stephenhollymartin.com. And that's the easiest way. Come to my website. Well, I want to thank you again for being on the Chaos and Light podcast. Well, thank you, Angela. I enjoyed it very much. I really did. Thank you so much for having me. Are you enjoying this podcast and want to help this lady out? Well, share it with friends or even better, leave a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear from you. Now back to the show. Well, that's it for this episode of the Chaos in Light podcast. Um, Coming up next week, we have Virginia Omen, and we have this beautiful conversation about the mind-body connection, about overcoming adversity. She was diagnosed with MS in 1988, and now she is a fitness coach and uh, really has um, just exceeded beyond all expectations. So it's a very powerful and inspiring story. So I hope you tune in for that. Um, And again, if you haven't checked out chaosandlight.com, please do so. Well, that's it. Take care and seek the mystery.